Good morning, colleagues and guests. Um, when Amy asked me to open this event, my immediate thought was, oh no, what do I say? That I've been there, experienced the fuzzy head, loss of confidence, hot flushes, not sleeping. Well, I have, and it's horrible. At the time, I didn't want to talk about it in case people viewed me differently. Perhaps someone who wasn't able to make those difficult decisions anymore. Perhaps someone who wasn't fit to hold a senior leadership role. I also shuddered when Amy, Amy put in capital letters in my diary, menopause event. I was thinking we need to tone that down a bit. But again, when challenged, um, and what I love about Amy, especially in the qualities role, um, I understood that we need to see it as it is. And let's face it, all women go through this. So why is it important we're talking about this today? Approximately 13 million women in the UK are either, are either peri or postmenopausal. Symptoms can last up to 15 years. Over 60% of women experience symptoms resulting in behavioural change. And one in four women will experience severe debilitating symptoms. And at Borders College, 68% of our workforce is female. And just under the quarter of our staff, 22%, are women aged between 45 and 55, the age range in which menopause is most likely to occur. So the chances are that someone you work with now is experiencing this. Evidence tells us that menopausal women are at a higher risk of suicide. Suicide rates for women aged 45 to 54 have risen 6% in the last 20 years. And almost 50% of menopausal women say that they are depressed, a third suffer with anxiety, and two thirds say that there is a general lack of understanding and support. So I'm incredibly proud that Borders College has been officially named as one of the UK's best um, places to work for women and wellbeing. But I also recognise that we have a lot more to do. And part of that is exploring how to create an inclusive workforce and workplace for women experiencing menopausal and perimenopause. We believe it's critical to our success that as an organisation, to create a menopause friendly workplace in order to attract and retain and develop talented women. The challenge of managing symptoms and their impact on daily life can lead to talent drain. The risk of qualified and experienced women at or near the peak of their careers are exiting their workplace. So I'll finish by saying look out for Borders College menopause policy. It's coming to you very soon. And before I hand over to Jeanette Kehoe Perkinson um, this morning, I just want to give you a little bit of background um, about Jeanette. So Jeanette was born and educated in Liverpool. She's developed an impressive portfolio career as global executive and executive coach, founder of a social enterprise and, and an independent director and board advisor. She's a long time advocate for developing women into leadership roles and is passionate about economic and community development and regeneration. Her LinkedIn bio states, I don't care how much you know until you know how until I know how much you care, which gives you a measure of Jeanette's values and is certainly a motto we should all hold on to. Jeanette has held numerous international management and global senior executive positions with companies including Ford Motor Company, Iceland Foods, Mayburn Group, ASB Bank, Novartis and Spark NZ, to name a few. Over the years, she's lived and worked in the US, the UK, the Netherlands, Gibraltar and Russia. Jeanette is now based in Auckland, New Zealand, with her family and is an executive board member, global chief People Officer and Managing Director of PH Creative, one of the world's most innovative and highly respected creative agencies. They are in fact one of the first organisations in the UK to sign up to the Menopause Workplace Pledge. 
A vocal advocate for developing women in leadership roles, Jeanette created the social enterprise Power Pause to support organisations to retain talented and experienced working women through the menopause. I met Jeanette about seven years ago whilst working in Liverpool. Her energy, passion and support for women has always stayed with me. So I was completely reassured when going through my own dark hole to find that Jeanette was campaigning for the impact of menopause to be better understood by employers. So all that said, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Jeanette, who is going to lead the, the keynote session today. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you so much for um, for that fantastic introduction. Um, I'm not sure I can possibly live up to it. Although you have done a lot of my job there, Angela, with some of the stats that you've um, that you've shared. But um, look, it's it's phenomenal um, to be invited to talk to you today, and um, I'm really excited about doing doing that. And I think that the amount of people that have come onto the call and from so many different organisations is just shows how many people find this a a really important issue now. And so um, I'm going to share with you a presentation today. Um, I'll probably turn my camera off because I am. I am talking to you from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, so I'm sitting at the moment. The screen behind me is actually my my executive job, which is um, for PH Creative, which is based in Liverpool, headquartered in Liverpool, but it's a global organisation. But I'm sitting in Auckland, um, so I'm a good advocate of um, of re remote working. But uh, but it also means that sometimes the the technology can uh, be a little bit glitchy. So I'll turn my camera off and I will share my screen. Uh, and I'm going to go through a, um, a, a presentation with you. And um, I am going to stop. I'm probably going to be quite annoying and stop every sort of slide to see that it's not lagging. Because um, when we tested, there was a little bit of a technical lag. So I'll just do that so I'm not running ahead of the, the slides for you. Um, but I will start sharing my screen. And the first thing I'll do is ask Amy, can you all see that? Thumbs up, Amy. Has it gone to, to slideshow? OK. So. As I say, delighted to be here today. And I'm just going to walk through the agenda of this session. We'll probably spend about 45 minutes just going through um this this little this this session um but i just want to go through why why power pause why why was there a need to create um a social enterprise called power pause and why it's important to normalize the the subject of menopause which angela has spoken to very eloquently and uh, why should workplaces care about this and i'm always intent on using the word workplace this is not about um, one type of sector. This is not about business. This is about every sector. It's everywhere where women work. And um, so I'll I'll go through why we should care about this. Um, and then I will explain and I'm going to I'm going to assume there's a zero knowledge, although I know that lots of you will be very, very informed, highly informed about menopause. But there may be a lot of people on the call who don't know much about it. Um, so I am going to kind of assume a zero based knowledge to go through what the stages of menopause are and then what are the known symptoms and possible remedies, because the practical application of this session is really about how can we make accommodation uh, to enable people to stay supported in the workplace, not quit uh, and actually feel engaged and retain through what is a temporary life stage. And then we'll have the questions at the end, um, which can be anonymous or can be part of a discussion. It's entirely going to be up to you. So Amy, again, are we, do you see that slide that says me no pause? <laughs> you may need to stay there, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm going to share a video with you and it will glitch, it's meant to glitch. Um, that's the nature of the video. Some of you may have seen this when I show this in New Zealand or Australia or Singapore or anywhere else. Um, people think that their Wi-Fi is glitching. It's not. Um, 
so this is going to glitch as part of it. You may have seen this advert run in the UK and it ran in about 2018, I think, uh, 2019. But I think that this gives, it sets the scene for the session. It's only a, just a little over a minute long. So I'll press play now. And, and then Amy, if you can give me a thumbs up, can you hear it? Okay. Everything's fine, really. Um, it's great. You sometimes feel like you're right. unraveling from the inside out. No one talks about it. There's this elephant in the room and you're it. <laughs> you sit there in silence, just growing more facial hair than your son. Um, and the mood swings, they are, um, shall we say, touch erratic. It's just terrible advice. Just stick your head in the freezer. I said, that's going to sort it. I said, great, thanks. It's really going to help with the sleepless nights. For the moment that my brain turns to puree. Very helpful, thank you. And the anxiety, that can just... But I won't let it define me. I may be changing, but I won't let it change me. I'm still a woman. I'm still a lover. I'm still a fighter. Still me. I won't let menopause change that. Holland and Barrett, supporting women through menopause naturally. Okay. So I'm on to why power pause. Great. <laughs> I think we're working now, Amy. Can you see we've got Madeleine Albright? Great. I think we're good. I think we're good. I think you can probably sit down. <laughs> if you want to though. I think we're good. We're past the uh, the technical video part. So um, look, why power pause? Look, I went through a horrendous experience with my own menopause and I just wasn't aware of all the symptoms and what can happen to you when you lose your essential estrogen. Um, and when I came out the other side, having just really had a, a, a terrible implosion, uh, quit my job, I thought, well, hang on, how did I not know any of that. When I started to research what had happened to me, and I thought I had early onset dementia, I thought, well, how, how did I not know about this? And, you know, from the generation of my mother and my grandmother were in, they didn't talk about these things. You know, they'd been, a lot of them had been through World War and they, you know, just didn't complain about anything as, as um, inconsequential to them as menopause. But actually, you know, it was also the days when they'd put people in asylums and a lot of women were put in asylums because they were thought to have gone crazy when really it was temporary and it was menopause. Um, so there was a, a generational silence and a generational silence around HRT after a debunked study, which we'll go into. Um, so it just meant that there hasn't been as much help or support for my generation um, and the generation immediately before me. And and so I thought, well, I can't let that happen to others. There's a Madeleine Albright, rest in peace, um, said there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. And I felt I just absolutely felt compelled to help other women. But once I started talking to people about it, they said, you're crazy. You know, this is this is taboo. People don't want to hear about it in workplaces. You'll never get another job. So this brings me to another Madeleine Albright quote, and I've put this in since she passed away last week because it's so important as a, a quote for life, really. But courage is when you stand up for what you believe in, when it's not always easy and you get criticised for it and you do it anyway. And that's how I felt about this issue. I just thought people were saying, don't do it, don't speak up, don't do power pause. And yet another whole cadre of people were saying, please speak up, please talk about it. So I just I wasn't going to be stopped by the naysayers and I decided to talk about my experience. And the first place that that appeared was when Saskia Gravel of um, Empowered Women, which is a, a really very lovely wo uh, website in the U in the UK um, and, and the UK is a lot further ahead than New Zealand. Um, but she asked to interview me as sort of the first businesswoman that she'd interviewed for her website. And this says May 24, 2020, but it actually came out, I think, in 2019 and was the very first thing that I'd ever done publicly. And it was terrifying and absolutely terrifying. And I really had to take a courage pill to talk about my story. But my story was that I'd been in executive roles, as Angela had said. I'd moved to New Zealand, thought it would be the easiest expat job of my life because 
hey, I had lived in other countries and I'd, it had all been fine in Russia and America and everywhere, you know, Netherlands and Gibraltar, expat assignments, you know, I could do that. But then I moved to New Zealand thinking it would be easier because my husband's a Kiwi, we've been coming here for 15 years, but menopause hit me in the middle of that. And when we moved here, um, and I'd, I'd moved into an executive role in one of the big banks here. And so I was on the exec team and I, I didn't go and renew the hormone replacement therapy that I was on. Uh, I didn't make time for that. So I, so the, the HRT that I'd been on in the UK, I didn't make time to go and renew it. It expired. I, 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 I ran out. And pretty soon after that, I just started to completely unravel like the video. Uh, I had brain fog. I couldn't write board papers. I was forgetting words in the boardroom. I was having hot flushes every hour and it was it was horrendous. And I eventually quit my job. And frankly, if I hadn't quit my job, I probably would have been fired for incompetence because there were so many incidents of me just not coping with the job. And it was the very first time that that had ever happened to me. So enough of me. Um, the purpose of power pause is really, and this is a this is around. I did I did start it to to really focus on New Zealand because nothing was happening in New Zealand at all. And while it was a massive wave of activity in the UK and in the US, um, and even starting in in Australia, there was nothing at all for women in the workplace and in New Zealand. And I couldn't find anything else, anything, any websites for New Zealand. Um, I had to go to websites in the US and the UK. Uh, so I just decided, right, well, we need something here. So I started Power Pause um, and I've put together a, a very, you know, my own funded by me, very simple website um, just to help people to aggregate information, to have one place, a one stop shop for lots and lots of information about Power Pause. So but, but the point of it is workplace education, um, we will be going into grassroots of policy change and legal change, which a group of us are working on right now. And educational change again to to, to start um, a change in the curriculum at grassroots level, like in the UK. So just to just to let you know, you know, we are aligned to the Sustainable De Development Goals, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and uh, and really, I just want to spend more time on on what this is, what menopause is, and why we need to talk about it. So in terms of statistics, now, can you see this says UK statistics? Are you on that slide? Yep, great, we're good. OK, so total population now, according to the Office of National Statistics um, last year, is over 67 million. Uh, the UN thinks it's 68 million now. Um, the total female population is is over 34 million. Now, Angela said, so, you know, this is over 10 million people. Um, I, I've done a very conservative estimate just looking at the stats of, in the age range as a demographic of 45 to 54. Now, menopause can start way before that. Perimenopause can start, you know, and it can start from 40. Um, it can start earlier than that if you've had a surgical procedure or if you have early menopause. So, you know, there's it, it's how long is a piece of string here. But generally, um, the average age for uh, menopause um, is 51 and you've generally you've generally had a menopause by 54. So I'm also I just want to make the, the point that I'm talking women. But basically, anyone with a uterus, so which, whatever um, gender you define yourselves at or identify um, as, uh, if you have a uterus, you will have menopause. Um, so just a few stats here. Um, life expectancy at birth is about 92 years. Uh, we're living longer and longer. Um, the usual perimenopause years of age are 45 to 54, but as I've said, it can happen any time before that. The, the bulk of people will have it sometime in, within that age range. The average age of menopause, 51. Uh, so actually, if you look at 92 and you're having menopause at 51, potentially you've got 40 or 50 years to live. And of those years, after age 51, you've probably got 30 years of really, really important work to do. And if you're like me and you don't ever want to retire because you just love what you do, 
then you know those those 30 years what you don't want to do is quit your job <laughs> at, at 51 and then go well now I'm facing ageism or sexism and ageism all wrapped up together what we want to do is keep the women in the workplace through their most powerful age so that they can go on into leadership positions and probably the macro reason I started power pause is that I believe there are enough women in leadership positions and the missing link with trying to get people through to leadership roles on exec teams on boards and leading countries is people fall out of of their their jobs and powerful positions right at the age where they're most powerful which is in that sort of sweet spot of late 40s early 50s and then don't climb back in and usually will go and start their own business or do something completely different um, so we're not getting the leaders leadership that we need in um, in representation of women um, so about 80 percent of women experience obvious perimenopause symptoms and so 60% of those experience symptoms which detrimentally affect their daily lives. So they'll have something that really kind of negatively affects them, but it's livable. 20% don't have anything at all. They sail through. But, you know, with those 20%, potentially they're going to get osteoporosis or heart disease because they're going to lose their estrogen as well. Um, and, you know, this is all about the loss of loss of estrogen mainly. Um, but 20%, about 20% experienced debilitating symptoms. And this was me, you know, to significantly affects their daily lives, causes all sorts of horrible um, things uh, like quitting jobs and suicides. And this is this is a piece that we've really got to look at. This 80%, we've got to help them to, to stay um, supported and to feel supported. Because as Angela said, one in four women consider quitting their job. That's a conservative estimate. But during menopause, so and there'll be probably a lot of women, uh, people in the audience today who have felt that way and uh, maybe not haven't talked about it, but have felt that way uh, and maybe feeling that way now. And just to look at this leadership issue in the and this is obviously like business now, but in the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 250, nine chief execs in each of those indices. So 18 people out of 350 of the top companies on the FTSE is shocking. It's absolutely shocking. 5% of our chief execs in our FTSE businesses, FTSE 350, are, are women. It's So this, this just, this, this makes me um, it just makes me frustrated uh, and want to do something about it. And women directors, both exec and non-exec directors, 32, that's actually increased substantially since a lot of work's been, been going into it, but still it's only a third on the FTSE 100 and only over a quarter, just over a quarter on the FTSE 250. So, you know, we really still have a massive leadership issue in terms of women. And then the suicide rate is highest in the age groups of 45 to 54, which is a massive shock to most people when I when I do quote that statistic. And Angela's just um, has just covered that. But just so you see the the data in the UK, um, you know, it's it, it's 45 to 54 in the UK. Um, we have the um, suicide data from the um, NZ, which I normally show on here, but I'm focusing on UK today. And then the US is 45 to 54 as well. I mean, it's just, it's incredible because most people would think it's it's in the teenage age range, um, but actually it's a very high statistic in women at this age range. So we've got to do something about it. Um, and can I just have a quick hands up that we're all on, why should men workplace care about menopause? Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> You were very, very, very kind to help. OK, so this is a lovely, just a lovely quote, I think, from Barack. But I'm absolutely confident for two years of every nation on Earth was run by women. You would see a significant improvement across the board on just about everything. Um, and Michelle may have helped him with that, but I, you know, he's right. He's right. We need we need more equity. So what is the business case for equity? This is quite business focused. Um, but McKinsey 
uh, companies in top quarter for gender diversity on their exec teams are 21% more likely to experience above average profitability. That's huge. And McKinsey, we all know, are, you know, they're not, they're not a tin pot operation. They're a global business that are full of stats and data. Um, Morningstar, in October 21, they did a huge amount of research and found that stocks of UK and North American firms with an equal gender split at board level um, had a 7.52% return on investment over three years compared with the average of 2%. So look, 7.5% compared to 2% just by having equity on your, um, on your board. Um, research from DDI, companies with gender diverse teams, 1.7 times stronger leadership, and this is in, in their MPS score, the MPS scores and in the research that they've done with thousands and thousands of companies, 1.4 times sustainable profitable growth and one and a half times a stronger growth culture. I mean, it's phenomenal. You can't, you just can't argue with these stats and there are many, many more, which I'm not going to bore you with. Um, but just to say, well, women hold 52% of wealth in the US um, and it's similar in the UK now. And women drive almost all of household, including tech and IT purchasing decisions. So this is a demographic that's really, really important. Um, and we know that equity is the right thing to do. It's also good for the bottom line. So that's a business piece. But but still, when we look at ac academia and the, where, what, the, the sector that you're in, um, when you look at people who quit their jobs and we've got you know it's the most important sector in my view you you, you you're teaching tomorrow's future um you teach you're teaching just you're teaching everybody you, te you, you do such an important job and i'm on an advisory board i'm on the advisory board of the university of liverpool business school i'm on the advisory board of auckland university business school so you know i understand and appreciate the incredible job that colleges do and i I did used to work in in a college as well as a consultant, um, and I and I I just think we've got to keep brilliant people in roles as lecturers, in roles as researchers, in roles as teachers. As as we've just got to keep people in the workplace. So I get very passionate about it. But when you look at the Personal Today survey, which is a UK survey, um, the Chartered Institute of Personal Development, three out of five working women believe their menopause symptoms are having a negative impact on them at work. Again, that's pretty huge. 65% um, said it affected their ability to con concentrate. That was definitely me. 58% said they experienced more stress. And 52% said it made them less patient with clients and colleagues. Now, in, in workplaces where you need collaboration with clients and college, colleagues, and academia is certainly one of those, yeah, you know, if you're less patient, 52% less patient. And there are so many from forward facing roles, so many client, your client being students and um, third party colleagues and all sorts of people. But if 52% are less patient, then it's going to have an effect on working relationships and on on people's experience. So nearly a third, 30% take took sick leave because of the symptoms. And this is this served survey, by the way, this is one survey. Many surveys have been done since this one, including one by Standard Chartered, the bank, which was a bigger survey. And this and the, the stats come out, you know, relatively the same. Some come out more than this, but only 25 percent of people that were taken sick leave because of menopause symptoms felt they were able to tell their manager why they were off. Which again speaks to this taboo, this fear that there's going to be some consequence. And we're breaking the taboo now, especially in the UK with Davina McCall and Diane Danzabrink and all the people who are working on this issue. Um, but it's still, no matter what, people still fear talking about it. So 45% said privacy was the top reason not to disclose their symptoms. 34% too embarrassed to say. And, and horribly, 32% said their manager was unsupportive. So even if they did want to talk about it, they didn't feel they could because their manager was unsupportive. Now, this is a survey in New Zealand, so I might skip through this very, very quickly, but just, just they allowed me to put some menopause questions onto a, health, a, a, a whole survey um, of women only. And 73% of women 
it, who entered the survey, which is about 3,000 people, um, said that it would be important to have menopause policies in, in, in the workplace. And 93% felt it was important to have freely available info and advice. Now, that's New Zealand, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. It's a much smaller country. But if you multiply in the UK, um, it's it's a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal importance. Women want policies in the workplace and lots of progressive companies are actually now putting things in, putting policies in place. So what exactly is it? What is menopause? Well, this is um, just something I like to share as a little, <laughs> a little break. Carrie Fisher, rest in peace again, um, in the Oscars said, before I get started, I just want to know, can everyone see me OK? I have to double check because I'm from Hollywood and women my age tend to be invisible. And, you know, this is a thing that people feel um, women feel invisible once they get into this third phase of life. Uh, I say third phase, I'm just breaking it up into 30, 30, 30. But um, in 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 Asian countries, it's called the second spring. It's a second phase and it should be a really powerful phase of life. And but people do tend to feel invisible. So what exactly is causing this? Well, menopause is derived from the Greek language, menos is month, pause to cease. And menopause itself is a really um, confusing word because menopause is actually only one moment in time. So it's the moment, the day, the moment of time when you've gone 12 months without a period. So it's really difficult for women to, 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 to track. It's very difficult to track because it's a retrospective diagnosis. And, you know, a lot of women like me, you know, you might go for six months, you might go three months, you might go four months without a period and think, oh, brilliant, I'm in menopause. And then suddenly it happens again, it only much heavier. And it really is, um, it, it's very, very difficult to track and remember when was your last one. So, but after 12 months, then you're said to have had menopause one date in time. But the real troublesome period is the perimenopause. So the perimenopause, it can last, I've said four to eight years here. It, it, it could, some people have, have it for 10 years, but it's a, it can be a really long period of time in people's life where you have a finite amount of, of, of eggs in your ovum when you of ovum when you're born. And when, as those eggs start to run out, as, as the supply of eggs is running out, that transition of eggs running out to, to stopping completely to the last egg being released, that last period, uh, that can last for four to eight, four to eight to 10 years. And that's when your oestrogen is declining, when you're stopping producing oestrogen. And that's what causes all of the menopausal symptoms, which we'll go into in a minute. Natural menopause, final menstrual period, we've gone through that, only retrospective diagnosis and usually between the ages of 45 to 55. And as I said before, the average age is 51. And then premature menopause, a lot of women will have menopause before the age of 40. And that's called premature menopause. Um, but some people, you know, can have it in their 30s. I think the, the youngest has been in their 20s. Um, it's, that's rare, very rare. Um, but again, you know, has all sorts of issues that come attached to that. If you have um, a surgical um, procedure, chemical procedure that that may cause menopause, like cancer, you know, a lot of women are are thrust into menopause because they had cancer treatment, which means that they've had to then um, have have parts of their reproductive system removed and it thrusts them immediately into menopause, which is you know, can be a terrible shock. And postmenopause is a period that I'm in now and I'm very, very happy to be in, which is um, 12 months after the final period. And then I'm not going to go through all of this. What I just wanted to show you on this slide, this is from um, a site uh, It's called menopause.now. I think it's called menopause.now, it's a US site, but it really just shows you in the blue, in the blue, where you've got estrogen levels on the left axis and um, age on the bottom, then it's just showing with that blue, that blue um, blob, the massive, massive um, 
deterioration, the symptoms of severe symptoms, you can see that they're all in that perimenopause uh, phase as your estrogen levels are declining. So perimenopause, estrogen's going down, 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 and then it levels off and off you go into postmenopause and postmenopause. Uh, and so perimenopause is really the, the, the problem time. And it's you, you're losing estrogen and progesterone, and those things need to be somehow um, replaced or, uh, or you just need to look after your, yourself better. And we'll go into a little bit about that um, in a moment. But just one thing I, I like to share is uh, a lot of a lot of women do feel overlooked, uh, invisible, or that they're a bit powerless after they've maybe people have quit their job or they don't feel like themselves anymore. They lose themselves. I lost myself through that that horrible phase, and um, and you know if you if you can get 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 back your energy after after menopause, you can get through it and then move on. You're full of energy after it, but going through it is the issue. And a lot of people think that they are now going to be too old to do anything useful. And I'm just here to tell you, Reese Witherspoon's here to tell you, you're not too old and it's not too late. And we are powerful post-menopause. So just to get into that before we go through the symptoms and um, some of the remedies, I just want to share with you some of the amazing things that post-menopausal um, women have. <laughs> and... Yeah, once you get through it, then you increase confidence, you have courage to act, make a stand for others, lots and lots of energy. Um, I've probably got more energy now than than ever. And Angela knows that I was always high energy, but I wasn't high energy through the uh, through that perimenopause hell. Um, the ability to articulate and and that feeling of in control again, I haven't lost myself anymore. You know that there's a, a lot of women. Um, really feel that they get themselves back they start to to recognize themselves again there's a sense of liberation you're powerful not afraid to speak your mind at this point in life you know who you are you know what you you're good at you know what you want to do and you're not afraid to speak your mind and then no more brain fog which was really seriously i thought i was never going to get my mind back i had gone to the doctor when i quit my job the day after I quit my job, I went, sat with the doctor, burst out crying, which I never usually do, um, over emotional, burst out crying. And I said to the doctor, I've got early onset dementia. And she said, don't be ridiculous. You're going through menopause <laughs> and you're in perimenopause. And here's, here's some HRT, which I was able to take. But the brain fog, I thought it was never going to go. I thought it was dementia. And now my brain's back and the fog has lifted you get a return of your memory you can find words um, and you can focus again which is amazing but one of the things is you are unwilling to tolerate bad behavior i've i've got into trouble um for not tolerating mansplaining in boardrooms and you know being a bit impatient with that um but you know it is what it is we 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 become very strong and powerful again and in postmenopause, this is just an interesting, um, an interesting thing that, that, that some people may already know, um, but for those of you that don't, once there, there aren't many species that have menopause. It's only humans and a couple of species of whales, and the female orca, once she's gone through menopause, she's then allowed to lead the pod. So the leader of the pod is a female, and it's an older female who's not reproducing anymore. And the reason that she's able then to lead the pod is that the, the, the pod feels that she is the most wise member. She has the most experience of where to find food. She has experience of how to keep um, the, the kids safe. She's got grandchildren, but she doesn't have to look after her own children anymore. And so much like, much like human females, um, you know, she she's free. She's she's not having periods as well. Um, she's not cramping up. She's she's not got kids to look after. So she's free to lead and she's free to keep everybody safe. And she greatly increases the children and grandchildren's chances of survival. And if there's one thing that most people go away from with from this uh, from this session, everybody remembers that orca, that female orca. It's a lovely, lovely thing. 
So what are the known symptoms? And I am galloping through, so we've got more time for questions. Um, but some of the most difficult symptoms for working women um, in CIPD survey, highly visible and comfortable hot flushes. Now, a lot of women do not ever get a hot flush. So a lot of women don't even think they're going through and they're not in perimenopause. I can't believe because I haven't had any hot flushes, but lots of women don't have them. Now, this is the CIPD survey uh, where 72% said they do have them. But in the general population of menopausal, perimenopausal women, many women don't have them. And in my sessions, a lot of women have said, well, I never got them, but I got so many more of the symptoms. Um, and it took ages to realise it was menopause. So, you know, a lot of women get the extreme fatigue because your sleep's being disturbed. A lot of women have night sweats and that disturbs your sleep. The heart palpitations. Who knew? I was telling my husband I would, I would go to bed and I said to him a number of times through this, I said to him, if I don't wake up in the morning, I've had a heart attack because I'm having heart palpitations, which I've never in my life had. And I I'm going to have a heart attack during the night. I had no idea that they were a symptom of perimenopause and they're really, really scary. And uh, of course, found out later and thought, whoa, I we have to share this. We have to share this. So um, more than half of the um, women surveyed said they experienced psychological issues. The mood swings like you saw in that video um, in the advert, really sudden mood swings. There's no that you cannot help them. I did suffer this. I was impatient and irritable with people and that is not who I am. And I didn't and I didn't recognize myself. And I hadn't been in New Zealand long enough for people to know that that wasn't really me. And it was really strange. But if you're if you've got coll a colleague or colleagues who are suddenly testy and impatient and irritable, then this might be it. You can't control it. It happens and it might be for two minutes. But I've been in the boardroom in my role as a as a group HRD, a, a global HRD. Now we call them chief people officer, which is what I am now. Um, but I've been in boardrooms going through succession planning meetings and talking about this pipeline of women that we've been trying to develop. I've spent hundreds of thousands of pounds developing women through leadership pipelines, mentoring schemes, get, sending people to Stanford and Harvard and executive programs to get them into um, promotions. And I've been in boardrooms where you'll talk about somebody who, whose high potential is ready for the next step up onto the general management or or senior leadership team and someone will say oh gosh no she's difficult she snaps at people she was aggressive the other day in, in, in a meeting and everyone will then go including me because I didn't realize would say oh no that's a terrible behavioral issue you can't possibly promote that woman and suddenly there's a stigma around someone who had a two-minute mood swing and I've been part of the problem with that I, I've been in that room and said oh yeah that's behavioral can't do that um and, it, and now i realize so many women who didn't get promoted had been had just been labeled as difficult because they had a two-minute mood swing um it's just wrong and then they'll come you know the the, the 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 workplace misses out on that incredible talent being in the leadership team and then we get the stats that we get so anxiety depression temporary memory loss brain fog we've been through that but they're all really awful symptoms. They're the most common ones that workplace um, surveys have revealed. But if we look at the 34 symptoms, and I'm just going to let this sit on the screen for a second, but this is the 34 that people talk about. And there are now considered to be more than this, but these are the main sim symptoms that, that kind of, we've talked a little bit about the most common symptoms. And then there are other physical symptoms, other mental, psychological symptoms. It's like a bingo list. And most women can check off probably 10, 15, some even 20 of these symptoms. But the difficulty that we have with women's health is every single woman is different. So the reason, one of the reasons that, that the medical profession hasn't done more on this and governments haven't done more on this is that 
every woman's different. It's really hard to it's really hard to know what stage somebody's at in their perimenopause. And also, you know, women themselves just don't know that these are all symptoms of perimenopause. There are oestrogen receptors all over your body. There are oest mass lots of oestrogen receptors in the brain and all over your body, which cause these symptoms because as your oestrogen declines, then that causes the symptoms that we see here. You know, there are connections to your brain that cause a brain fog and memory loss, anxiety, loss of confidence. Some of the, the physical symptoms, the weight gain, you know, I, I, I had a huge weight gain and that caused me to lack confidence then in the boardroom. I couldn't find suits to fit. I was on a bank executive team and, I, and my, my, my clothes weren't fitting me. My suits suddenly weren't fitting me. I was getting thick around the middle and that, that, that does cause a loss of confidence. And then you think, I've never had a loss of confidence in my role, but I did and it was horrible. And it all then causes, you know, that whole, I need, I need to quit. I've, I've got dementia. <laughs> so we've got to help people through this. So what are some of the possible remedies? Well, of course, every day I tell myself, Susan, you have to stop drinking so much wine. But thankfully, my name's not Susan. Um, now, wine is not really a very good uh, thing in, I mean, alcohol is not good for, for menopause, but, um, you know, we have to get through it as, as best we can. But I, I will provide some other <laughs> remedies um, and for workplace accommodation, uh, just, you know, one of the best things that you can do is create the environment where people can talk. So sessions like this today, you know, kudos to Amy and kudos to Borders College for putting this on. It's really important that we create the environment that people understand that the workplace that you're in is uh, empathetic about this, is creating um, opportunities for people to talk about it without embarrassment. We've got to normalise the conversation and then it just becomes a normal thing like puberty. And, you know, at either end of the reproductive cycle, when puberty happens and teenagers slam doors and grunt and shout and are, are thoroughly unreasonable at times, people don't hold it against them for the rest of their life <laughs> and refuse to employ them or, you know, any of those horrible things that happened at the other end with menopausal women. So we've just got to normalise it. People talk about puberty. They don't talk about menopause and normalising it will will really help it. So if we can adjust the temperature, create, you know, allow people um, ventilation. I couldn't do this in the office I was in. We weren't allowed to, it was all, you know, temperature controlled. You couldn't even open a window. The alarm would go off if you open a window. And, um, and one of the things that you can do is, you know, one of the companies that I talked to recently, um, which was a major bank, um, is now has now put work uh, fans on every single workspace so they have activity based working and they put them in every room on every workspace so people don't feel um, that they've been singled out and they don't have to ask for a fan but there's one on every workspace um, flexible out well most people do flexible working now but you know if you're in an environment where you need um, uniforms then adapting uniforms to ensure comfort um, this is this is big in in a, in um, organisations who have uh, customer service teams and client fa and customer facing teams in branches and things like that and, and retail stores and all of that. But uniforms need to be breathable and generally, and this is another thing. And I work in employer branding with, with PH Creative. Um, one of the reasons that people give us when we do research that they don't want to 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 join an organisation is that they don't want to wear the uniform if it's not if they haven't thought about that breathable material. A lot of women have quit the NHS. We've put, you've probably seen the articles about the you know thousands and thousands of women quitting the NHS through the pandemic because they've had to wear full PPE and it's not breathable as well and it's really hard to work through the hours that they work. So we've lost surgeons and doctors and nurses um, and administrators in the NHS because of that. Um, easy access to cold drinking water and washroom facilities, access to quiet places if you can, and the ability to sit down um, and noise cancelling headphones. These are all things that you can do to accommodate, you know, physically accommodate in the workplace. But this, the most important thing is empathy. 
the most important thing. If I had had that when I was going through mine and I did not have that, no one knew what I was going through, neither did I. Well, we all knew I was going through menopause because of the hot flushes. But other than that, there wasn't much support and particularly not around the sudden mood swings. <laughs> so empathy is really, really, really important. And then HRT for people that can take it. Um, most do report it's a game changer that me for me it saved my life and I really mean that I went to a dark place when I had quit my job and I didn't realize why I'd done it um, I, it was this HRT was a game changer when my doctor said slap a patch on your bot or on your on your tum um, and take this take a progesterone tablet then it was it absolutely changed my life my symptoms went away for the most part um, still have a, a little hot hot time every now and again, but um, but now that the um, sensationalised risks that the media sensationalised and back twenty years ago, the um, these were debunked. the The fears about HRD were debunked in two thousand two, and I'm sure a lot of you will have seen all of that in the work that's gone on with the um, Kate Muir and um, Davina McCaw with that with that work, but. Unfortunately, um, even though that's all been debunked, a lot of women can't take HRTs due to illness such as cancer. Um, but for those that can, just an explanation, it does replace the, the hormones of oestrogen. And the debunked study as well was about an old form of it as well, which was tablet form. Uh, now it's in patch, you can still get tablets, gel spray implants. There's lots of ways of taking it, which is actually very safe. Progesterone in a tablet form is usually, uh, go, usually goes along with 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 the estrogen patch, um, and testosterone for a few women. If you're really really lagging in energy, some women find they need a little bit of testosterone, which is not as common. Um, but you know, some some doctors will actually prescribe that. And then menopause friendly foods. And I, I apologize for rushing now, but I want to leave a bit of time for questions. So these are just normal, healthy foods that you'll all know are good for you. Um, but they're good for, for you in during menopause or during perimenopause. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. And this is being recorded if you want to go back through it. But um, then herbal helpers. There are lots and lots of herbal um, remedies that that can help your symptoms, but nutritional therapists say, you know, try one at a time, don't buy the whole shop. Um, just try one at a time and give it a few weeks to see, has it helped you? I know before, when I when I did run out of my HRT, I took sage tablets, which did help my, um, particularly my um, hot flushes. Uh, but, you know, as she said, however tempting it is to buy up the whole aisle, pick one. Try it for a few weeks, see if you notice a benefit, try another one um, if you don't and you'll see what works for you. And they're, again, different for, for every woman. Um, and then breathing techniques. Um, and I'm almost finished with cognitive behavioural therapy. Again, uh, I'll leave this for you to go through and, um, and look at again once it's posted up on the Borders College uh, site. But breathing is really, really... Uh, heavy you know breathing through your nose for count of one breathe out for count of three um is really really good for, uh, for easing anxiety so um you can't help but relax when you but when you breathe out so just you know that's diane danzabrink who is in my view one of the most wonderful people in the world right now <laughs> um lack of sleep is a big issue uh, causes all kinds of issues. So um, if you are having trouble sleeping, there are things like taking account cold showers, switching off your screens, not having devices in your bedroom, um, sleep remedies. And yeah, yeah, if you can reduce alcohol, don't use it as a crutch, um, keep off it, try and reduce sugar, um, refine carbs, all. If you, if you can just stop uh, or reduce those, uh, we're all human. And I cannot stop my wine every now and again. Uh, I'll just say that. But we're all human. Uh, but if you can reduce it, it, it really helps. Cotton bedding, natural cotton all in a nightwear. 
So those things will really help. And then the last thing is, you know, this is from Meg Matthews' book. Meg Matthews has written a fabulous book. Um, and her daughter gave advice to other children who said, be understanding, talk about it and do things to help. Um, so, you know, your children, I talk to, I've talked to my children all the way through this once I realised what I'd gone through. So they're really clued up and they're just fine with it all. It's very normal to them. Um, this is just something I share. Very, It's a free resource, but there's so many resources in the UK um, now. But powerpause.co.nz um, is, is a site where the resources page has so many articles. It has loads and loads of websites and books and all kinds of things. Um, and I do need to update it. And it's not the flashiest website in the world, but I think you've got really great websites in the UK. And a lot of them are listed on my site, um, but you've got some fantastic websites there. And you've also got probably the best doctor in the world, I think, that's um, recognised as, as one of the best, which is Dr. Louise Newson, um, who many of you may be aware of. She's phenomenal. And also she's created the Balance app. And so we've now got a menopause charity in the UK. Um, it's all happening in the UK. It's fantastic. Um, but the last thing I'll leave you with is your body may change, but your worth will stay the same. Never, ever forget that. We are powerful women. And for the men in, who are on the call, thank you for being here because you are, will be or are affected by this with the women in your lives. So whether you manage and lead teams of women, whether your partner, whether your aunt, whether your sister, whether your daughter, you know, whoever it is, There'll be somebody in your life that is going through this life stage who would value your understanding and support. And I thank you for being on the call. But for, for women, for all of you on this call, please remember this. You are worth worth it. Yeah, L'Oreal, you are worth it. Uh, but you are worth it. And we've got a hell of a lot to do with our lives after 50. A hell of a lot. We've got a lot of change to make when we see all these um, ego driven, warmongering people in the world. We've got lots of leadership to to give to the world. So I will end there. I will stop my presenting and I will ask for the questions to start.